Hi, I'm Matt Cranston with Sudbury TV. When I was a boy, I loved to hear my grandfather tell stories of how things were done on his Depression-era New England farm and how his father and grandfather did things in a time when every modern convenience we have today didn't exist. I want to explore the old methods and meet modern people doing archaic things, often with tools and techniques that haven't changed in over 100 years. Let's take a step back in time together. I hope you'll enjoy this episode of The Old Fashioned Way. Today we're in Sterling, Massachusetts, where the local land trust has chosen to use draft animals, as opposed to heavy machinery, to log conservation land. Land Trust board member Marion Larson explains. So the Sterling Land Trust was interested in, in doing some forestry on the property and improving the, uh, the quality of the forest there as for both the forest and the wildlife. So we hired a, uh, a forester, a, a consulting forester, who specializes in utilizing draft animals. Uh, one of the great things about using working animals, draft animals, oxen and horses, is they really uh, have a minimal impact uh, compared to using a lot of heavy machinery. And that's, that aligns with what we're very interested in, in terms of conserving the, uh, the ecosystem and the uh, soils in, in our forests. And the really fortunate thing is that across the street from the property that we own, there is a 100-year-old sawmill that is still operating. And we thought, why not show folks what it was like to do forestry with large draft animals and also see what people were doing way back in the day when it came to cutting the uh, logs into lumber. A few days later, I got to watch the work up close and meet the drivers and their teams. I guess he likes that camp. I'm Tom Jenkins and this is Rock. And this is Star over here. That's what happens when you let your kids name your ox and they're rock stars. I'm a consulting forester. I'm the guy that goes out and I decide which trees get cut and which ones stay. Mark property boundaries, lay out logging access, all that sort of stuff. Acts the middleman between a landowner and a logger. And most of the time I'm working with really big machinery. And I've always had oxen as a hobby. So you always want to make your hobby your work. You know, that's what you really like. So I started figuring out that there was a little bit of a call for low impact logging. I was getting more and more contact with landowners who would tell me they weren't interested in harvesting timber for the money. That they didn't care. They wanted to have a healthy forest. They wanted to have good wildlife habitat. A lot of it comes down to economy of scale. If you have a $100,000 machine that's capable of pulling 12 entire trees at a time, then you have to pull 12 trees at a time to make any money with that machine. I pull one log at a time most of the time. So I can do a different kind of job. The, the big benefits are uh, we can have really narrow skid trails. You know, I can skid logs on a four-wheeler trail or a snowmobile trail, and I don't bang up all the trees on the side of it. Uh, Brad and I did work here every day this week. Even in the rain, we were out here skidding logs. So our main trail is uh, a little bit slippery. It, it's not rutted, you know, it's not ankle-deep mud but it's about as worse as you'll get working with draft animals. So um, if you want to see the worst we can do, it's, it's right here. <laughs> but Rock, Star, and Tom are only half the crew on this project, which wouldn't be nearly as efficient without the other team in the woods. My name is Brad Teeter from the farm school in Athol, Massachusetts. Uh, this is King and Tom, a Belgian team of horses. They're about 17 years old or so. They've been working on the farm and in the woods since they were five or six years old. They weigh about uh, 1,700 pounds or so, maybe 1,600 pounds each. A good size. They're not too big, you know. They're easy to put the harness on, and um, <clears throat> but they're big enough to pull these big logs here. Well, I started working horses in 2002. Uh, but I didn't get my first horse till maybe 2005 or so. Uh, we had horses on the farm that I learned on. And this is my third team now. Tom's got a good story of how he got his first team. 
Well, I got it when I was five. My grandfather told my mom he was going to get me a team, and she said, no way, he's too young. And then uh, the next day, we went and got him. <laughs> and uh, he had an old, uh, old junky AMC Hornet car. And uh, we went to a dairy farm. It was just a couple of miles from home. And he had two bull calves there. So we stuck them one at a time into a grain bag and stuck them in the trunk of the car and drove them home and made two trips. And so I got my first team in the trunk of an AMC Hornet. <laughs> I asked Brad and Tom to explain a bit about their gear, the harnesses, yokes, and carts they use. This is the n traditional New England D-ring harness, which was developed for working in the woods, um, the hilly, tight woods um, of New England. It allows the horses to maneuver better in the woods uh, by putting the weight of the cart or weight of the tongue or pole of the bobsled or whatever conveyance you have on their backs as opposed to their necks, which um, allows the horses to work longer without getting t as tired, as worn out. Um, and it just al allows the, the vehicle um, to move and maneuver better in the woods. This is the D-ring, um, that's why we call it the D-ring. All, it's the center of the harness really, so um, everything, all points come off of here. The front trace, which leads to the um, back trace, and it pivots on here, so um, you always have your draft in line. And then it hooks to the jack saddle, which holds the weight of the cart, the tongue, and then to the neck yoke here. And then, of course, you have the, um, the belly band that just holds it together. There. Well, here's the, the trace, uh, or the tug is what they call it. And this is hooked to the evener, all right? And this is, this is how they pull the load from right here. Um, and this right here is what we call a logging arch um, on a Pioneer 4 cart. Um, what it does is... Uh, you hook your chain that's hooked to your log right up to the slip hook and into the grab hook. And when you move forward, when the horses move forward, it pulls the log off the ground, the butt end of the log off the ground, which allows them to uh, not pull as much weight. Right. And the, the log won't dig into the ground. I use this cart. It gives them a real advantage pulling the logs. I back the cart right up tight to the, to the end of the log. And then when they pull on it, it gives it lift. And so if I get my chains hooked really tightly, it'll lift it up and you can actually see air for a few feet you know, back. So I'm picking up on it as we pull forward. Their bone in their neck actually isn't right under the yoke. It's much slower. It comes down in here. So this big chunk up here is all, all muscle. So this allows them to, to use that, the, the weights pulls down on the yoke when they're pulling, and so they can kind of get up underneath the load and pick up on it with their strong necks. That's over 2,000 pounds of logs there, by the way. Tom showed me one way to hitch the logs to the cart. Use a set of log tongs here, and uh, just kind of grip the log. And sometimes they make it easier than having to run the chain around underneath it. They work really well with the cart because the cart gives a little bit of uplift and keeps them hooked on. Yeah. If I didn't have the cart and I just hooked it directly to a chain to the team, yep. they fall off more than half the time and um, just aggravate you all day long. But with the cart, it seems to be the right, uh, right combination to really make it quick and easy. Just across the way, Brad demonstrated a different hitch technique. This is a uh, chain with a slip hook on one end and a grab hook on the other. The slip hook helps to, uh, it grabs onto the, well, when you pull forward, the, uh, the chain tightens around it, so it can't slip off the log in most cases. And I like to get them where the um, notch is on the ground, so it's like a little nose to the log. It helps the, um, helps the horses out a lot. I see it. Okay. That's perfect right there. There you go, slip hook on in place. I always uh, move it over to the side just a little bit so when they pull, it rolls just a little bit. Gives them a little momentum there. Hey, start. Step up. Tom also explained how he can move 5,000 pounds of beef with just his voice and a one pound stick. I use my stick. Um, this one's a whip, it's flexible, got a little bit of a lash on it. 
Um, this thing is so flimsy, I, don't, I couldn't hurt him with it if I tried to. So I just tap him with it to give him signals. So if I want to turn to the right, per se, I would, would tap him on the nose and say the word G, and then tap him on the, on the back, and it's telling him to stop and him to go, and we turn around to the G side. And then Ha is just the opposite. I'd tap him on the nose and, and tap the other one on the rear, and they'd turn to the G side, or the Ha side. Um, I tap their knees with it to tell them the back. So we use G and haw, which is the same for almost every kind of draft animal. Um, ox teamsters use it, horse teamsters use it. Um, they use it with mules and sled dogs. And I, from what I understand, it goes all the way back to 15th century England, where we get G and haw from, and we still use it today. Two teams on a job like this is rare. Both Tom and Brad were grateful for the added efficiency of splitting the work based on the strengths of their teams. I'm working the oxen and the brush and the slash and getting the logs up onto the main trail. Um, that way the horses are a little bit faster. They can run out that main trail and um, hopefully we're using both horse and ox to their best efficiency with that method. Well, it was good to um, work with somebody else. Normally I'm working by myself in the woods with the horses. so. It was nice to have the extra company and to use the animals um, in the best ways they can be used. Horses for the long skid on most days, oxen twitching right to the main trail, um, and that allowed us to get more wood out quicker. Being an ox guy, I'm going to blame this muddy trail on the horses. Their hooves chew it up more than the bulls do. Get up here funny because you think the bulls would weigh more. They do. The sheep, their hoof is different. Brad mulled it over. Oxen versus horses. Well, um, I like horses. I've had oxen and horses. Um, I do miss the oxen now, but I love the horses because there's a little bit more involved, as you can see, with the rigging, the harness. There's more there to it than just a wooden yoke. But to me, um, the horses are a little bit quicker, you know, uh, and I can ride on the cart more than uh, Tom has to walk everywhere he goes. But you know, I've got the two lines here that I can drive the horse. Uh, I don't know, I, it just depends on what you like, I suppose, really. That's what it all comes down to. You know, he, he's an ox guy and uh, I like the horses. Some people like tractors more, you know. <laughs> Which are smarter? Ah, <laughs> mules. <laughs> the blue paint is marking that foresters put on the trees. So that delineates the harvest trees. So you put a spot at eye level where you can see it and then a spot down in the stump so you can come back and look later and see that only the marked trees were harvested. And uh, how does that tie into the name of your farm? Uh, <laughs> I call myself Blue Dog Forestry and that's because at the end of a day of painting trees I have blue paint all over my dog. He's always between me and the tree and gets little speckles of blue on him and everywhere I go people are asking me what's the blue stuff on my dog so it's uh, Blue Dog Forestry. It's about time to head over to the sawmill. But first, Tom's got one last story about working his oxen in deep snow. So these guys, once they know the skid trail, they'll go out to the landing on their own. So if I stayed here for you know another week and we kept pulling logs on the same trail, I could be back there in the brush and I'd hook that log up and I'd just tell them, get up. And then I'd take a step out of the way and let them go. And uh, they'll take the log all the way out to the landing on their own. You know, if I could just get them to unhook it and then come back, I'd be, <laughs> be really good. There's, there is one funny story where I was working, you know, more than a mile in the woods on a little discontinued road. I, I was kind of blocking off the end of the road, and the snow was two years ago. The snow was waist deep up there, and so I would just hook them up and I'd tell them to go, and then I would walk behind them in the trail the log made. And so it was the end of the day, and they were kind of he had a good pace through that snow, much faster than I could go. So they just kept going until they were out of sight. And I was kind of worried that I was get up there and it would be 
I left the door of the trailer open. I thought, oh no, they're going to be inside the trailer with a log behind them. And I get up to my trailer and they're not there. <laughs> I can see their tracks went around my truck and down the road. So I dropped my chainsaw and my gas can and took off running and I got to the end of the road and I could see the brown mark from the log turning to the right. And so I started jogging down the road and they still weren't in sight. And Next thing you know, I'm taking my chainsaw chaps off and hanging them on somebody's mailbox and sprinting down the road. And I caught them about a mile away. <laughs> so, and, and the whole time they had an ash log about that big behind them. away from the woods is Crystal Brook Farm, where they've got a hundred-year-old sawmill, and we're kind enough to demonstrate how it works. Okay, I'm Eric Starbard, and I own Crystal Brook Farm here in Sterling. It's been in my family since 1920. We have 112 acres, and part of the farm's success is having the sawmill, which I acquired in 1990. It's over 100 years old, and originally manufactured in Montpelier, Vermont. When this mill was made, it was set up to be a water-powered mill. It's known as a left-hand sawmill, meaning the logs come in on my left side, and I operate the set works for the mill with my left hand. Most mills are right-hand mills, which is the opposite. The logs come in on the other side, the lumber comes off this side. So basically what this handle does, uh, it's calibrated out on a wheel and the, there's a cog that sits in the wheel and each time I pull one full pull, it's an inch and a quarter. So I get a one inch board and the other quarter inch is the saw kerf that takes out the sawdust. What does kerf mean? Kerf is the actual cut of the saw removing the wood. So that has to be factored into each pull. If it wasn't, I'd only get a three quarter inch board. And I can do all kinds of combinations just by knowing how this is set up. And I also refer to this scale. This tells me how far my head blocks are from the saw. So I can size up a log and I can reference this scale and I know where to set my cog in this wheel to get what I want. And I have to also clamp the log down because as I pass through the saw it's a fair amount of force with the saw cutting the wood. So these various dogs and clamps on this carriage are utilized to hold the log securely on the mill as it passes by the saw. So right now I'm edging the boards that came off the log. They have a rough bark side to them. So I'm taking the bark off and making them a board. out of it and then I set the mill to that width of a board and the saw cuts it to that width. So I'm going to get about a seven inch board out of this just by eyeing it up. So I set it in seven. Cherry. I'm going to make six 
by eight cans out of the middle of it for the fellow that's logging with the oxen so he can make the yoke for his oxen. There you have it. Inside that slab is a six by eight block that will become a yoke for Tom's younger oxen team. That's gonna do it for this episode of The Old Fashioned Way. Until next time, don't take any wooden nickels. We're always on the lookout for artisans to feature on The Old Fashioned Way. So if you or someone you know builds or cooks or makes or does something the same way it's always been, please contact us at Sudbury TV.